puts me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Last week, Hanna and I took a mental break. From, is that what that was? It was a mental break. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We, okay. you know, in, okay. fa- in, fa- in fairness, you know, we had a week off uh, due to super busy schedules between your work life and my work life and the holiday and family and all that, you know, fun stuff that we love so much and uh, the fireworks you love. And, you know, yeah, so with, hiding <laughs> in the basement with shaking with, with dogs, the dogs and terrified yeah. children. Yeah. With the dogs. You got to be in the basement with the dogs. And then. Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, we had a, I, I decided to post a rather um, personal episode, in fairness. You know, it was just a discussion <laughs> between us. Yeah, it was one of those things, was you know, a... I record 90% of what we talk about all the time. Even when we're not recording, or we're not supposed to be recording, I just record things. Because sometimes, you know, our conversations just churn, and the next thing you know, three hours later, we're like, oh, hey, that should have been an episode. It's like, hey, I recorded that. I was proactive (laughs) and 90% of the time or 95% of the time it's worthless garbage and nobody wants to hear like nobody be like, yeah, I want to go out for that one. But this one was a good conversation. It's a dead spot on a hard drive somewhere that nobody ever needs to hear. (laughs) But this one, this, this one was fun. I know the music stuff. That was a good time. I enjoyed that. We kind of went all over the place. So like really like a wavy tangent. Yeah. And you know, a lot of podcasts get paid lots of money to do that. I, mean, I wish some, maybe somebody would pay us lots of money to do that. That'd be kind of fun. You know, I, we've said before, hey, we don't really want to sustain ourselves. We like our jobs. But I'll tell you what, after the last couple of weeks at work, yeah, I, I feel, hey, maybe this would be funner to sit around or that's not a really a real word. But hey, because we are podcasters, we can make up new words, right? We do, we've done this for <laughs> two years now. I made up words and you've ex- you've accepted them. Um. But it, it might be fun. I, I don't know. It, it might actually be something fun that we could do. Um, I'm not saying anybody should go do that, but, you know, it would be kind of fun to, you know, if we had full time jobs as podcasters or radio personalities or whatever, even if it was only the, for like a year, you know. The big thing that for me is like I listen to a lot of stuff on, on NPR. So they have the Gimlet and um, a lot of these other um the media fun house or something. There's a couple of different companies that kind of did what we used to do with atheist analysis and they're growing like a network where they pick up a bunch of shows and they have a bunch of people working together and they get donations from each show and it turns into like this big conglomerate where they have money and they have, they can get new equipment and they can get teammates in there to create stuff and edit and, and do research. And so they, the big thing for all these cool shows that I like to listen to is they have researchers that can go in and then they have editors that'll edit. So like you, you it, it's a full time thing for them, but like they, they have all of these tools that really make it awesome. So like the big thing that I would see if it was like, if that's what we did full time, we're able to like just be radio people is like the quality of what you can do. Cause it's what they talk about it's like, yeah, we spent the last three weeks, last four weeks researching this one story for this one episode. I can't even imagine what it's like to dedicate that much time to one story for one episode. So they do like eight, 10 episodes, 12 episodes every six months or so. And they, they go deep dive into amazing research. Like I would love to be able to do that, but like it's just with our lives. We just, you know, hit these short little topics because we can't invest that much time into it, which I mean, it's fair that we're we're doing this part time, but it's still that would be the big difference. I would love to just like bury my head into something. Yeah, kind of like uh, what was the name of that podcast, uh, Maxwell, that you introduced me to? Um, and I can't remember. Malcolm Gladwell. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, revisionist history. There is you really go. Good. Yes, and it's funny because when you mentioned it, I was like, mm, "Yep, revisionist." No, thank you. <laughs> like that just it's, sounds it's amazingly not. awful. But it's yeah, you're right. It's not it's not revisionist at all. And that's kind of, you know, the the thing is, you know, you talk about somebody that can take a topic and go through things and truly research and spend quite a bit of time doing these things. His stories are amazing. 
even you know it's funny even the one on french fries they had a that a, one a whole dude. episode on french fries for christ's sake yeah, McDonald's broke his heart. I've I've been wanting to try to make be- French fries on, um, on uh, beef callow. I've been wanting to try it. Like one day I'm gonna buy a brick of beef fat and I'm gonna fry my own French fries, and it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, uh, that was one of my that was one of my favorite episodes that he had. The, that one and the one that had um, Winston Churchill and his best friend, who was this sociopath. That guy yeah. was a psycho. <laughs> yes, exactly. I can't, I can't remember his name, but uh, and it talked about how, but also how he and Winston both were responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of people in India because they were, not because of like a war famine or anything. It's like they were just jerks. They were, I mean, you could even call it racist, but I mean, we all know how the British treated the colonies. So like the Indians really, like in India, not like Indians, like the United States likes to crap all over that term. Um, but like he, he did horrible things. So like I, that... That go and dive into that. I had no idea what that was, but and they fully explained everything. It's just really cool. So like that's what I wish we could do more of. But we got three nice little topics here that we're just gonna kind of knock out tonight and have some fun with. And um, I don't know. It's not gonna be too depressing. That middle one might be. <laughs> it, it might be. I, I don't know. You know, it's kind of one of those things that we we talked about that you know last week is you know how are we going to you know just essentially say hey. We're taking a night off because, you know, I think I think everybody deserves a night off in some aspects. Right. You know, if you don't, all you're going to do is continue to go crazy and you're going to get angry and you're going to see all these things that are happening in the world. And you're just going to you're going to shut down. And so, you know, every once in a while. And, yeah, I understand that there's a little privilege to it, but every once in a while, it's yeah. OK for us to decompress. You know, like that's <laughs> yeah. what last week was. And, and you know, it's kind of funny because. You know, I was sitting here, you know, going through the episode, you know, editing it, you know, taking out some of the uh, queasy spots. And, you know, as I go through this, I sit here, I'm listening, I'm like, you know, people don't get to hear friendships all that much, right? And, you know, it's kind of funny, yeah. as, as much as, as we've been together, hung out together, we've spent a lot of time talking over virtual airwaves. And I don't, th- I don't think, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people, especially in the secular, you know, community that go, I don't have a close family. I don't have a close set of friends because I live in a very conservative area or I live in a very Christian area. And even though we, you and I don't live in that uber Christian area, that's how our, that's how we met. That's how we spend most of our, our friendship together is, is, is a virtual in virtual time. And yeah. I, I think it's important because, you know, I think it's good to, for people to feel that, to see that that's not just them. A, and B, it allows yeah. for people to kind of understand that, you know, you can have a true friendship online. You can nurture this. It's not, you know, I mean, if you were a Trump loving sodomite, I would be OK <laughs> with it. But I would give you a lot of shit for, you know, loving Trump. And it would be a whole well, different it's discussion. More, it's important to have someone that you can like you can get into. You can get into some disagreeing uh, conversations with. And but you can also like ha- like you you can both coalesce onto something or even like a group of people like everybody can kind of sort of agree that this thing is stupid and we can have different ways of disagreeing about other little things here and there but like to have somebody that you know like kind of is like wind- windier sail and those kinds of things are important because we spend so much time in these um, like confrontational conversations and, and relationships out there in the real world nowadays like all, all you got to do is just say that you don't like donald trump and that'll that'll ruin like an entire relationship with some people so like i don't know it's nice to have something like we've had some some you know back and forth about stuff but like we learn from each other and then that, that online stuff is important like people should do more of that i i, I don't know i i People say that you, you had to get off the internet and you need to get away because it's harder to have these like really mean, sterile conversations when you're face to face with someone. But also like having something where you can, you know, really flesh out your ideas and spend time working on arguments and thoughts. Like that's also nice because when you're doing it in person live, it's really hard to hit all the notes and have some, you know, like, <laughs> to have like a Google Doc open in the background is impossible. Exactly. Exactly. So tonight. <laughs> We are going to get a little bit more serious again. Okay. You know, we have to a little bit, I think. I do think we kind of have to. Um, because. <laughs> so we're going to do it. 
I don't. What are I, we starting with then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. So there's a couple of different it's, things, it's <laughs> but I, I really kind of want to talk about the denaturalization task force. Okay. I, I we're going to talk about yours and my and our family's love for the Grand Rapids Public Museum in a minute. We had <laughs> quite a few wishy washy moments a few minutes ago, but we'll, we'll talk. We'll we'll come back to that. You know. Because I think I'm gonna, we're going to need a decompression break again. We already had, we had a week off. We did a fun episode and now we're back and like, <laughs> I'm already feeling, you know, the heaviness of this episode. <laughs> but I, I, I cannot even imagine what's going through some people's minds right now because Trump came up with what he's calling a denaturalization task force. Just, Which is somehow amazingly worse than the Space Force. I didn't think yeah, that could get any worse than that. Exactly. And and and, and you sit here and we we talk about this, and you, and you sit here and you go, "This is this is a nightmare. This is a dream. There's no way this is real." Like I'm sitting here going, "This is bizarro land." You know, like it's kind of funny because um, I don't know if anybody's why. I think we talked about Community before. Um, huge Community fan over here. Love that yeah. TV show, and I love that Dan Harmon. In all fairness, but. <laughs> You know, we talk through some of these things and they have this they have this like whole run of uh, of series of episodes where they have, you know, basically these backward individuals come and they call it the darkest timeline. I literally feel like I'm in the darkest timeline. I literally feel there's people with mustaches running around going, oh, ha, ha, we've got you this time, <laughs> you know, and I guess that's I don't want to be a dick to, you know, French people, but. You know, like <laughs> I just I, I literally feel that there's all these people walking around laughing at us going, holy crap. Can you believe what's going on in the United States right now? Can you they they came out with Space Force and there's there's no there's no such thing as aliens and there's no such thing as anybody trying to attack us from outer space right now. But they came up with it because they had to be the first, you know, because being the first is amazing in their eyes. And now they're coming up with something called denaturalization task force. Do you know, do they even understand what's comical and what's like actually like offensive? I, I just, I think people have to be laughing at us right now, man. Like they have to be laughing at, we don't understand or we elected somebody that just doesn't grasp what the fuck they're putting in here. I don't know. I've got some friends. I, I was talking to some people. Uh, one of my friends, Jordan in, uh, uh, in England, he lives in uh, Liverpool and I've also talked to a couple of friends in Turkey. And one thing I will say is that as much as Americans love to think that everybody else is watching everything that we do and paying attention completely and totally to like how crazy Donald is, uh, the British are kind of losing their minds right now. They may actually have to have an election because their government is falling apart as it, as we speak. Uh, the Turks have just turned their president into a pseudo light dictator uh, there's there is some really crazy stuff happening out there that Donald Trump is just kind of a symptom of this geopolitical recession that was happening. And so like as much as people are like, yeah, Donald Trump created the Space Force. That's just ridiculous. It's a bunch of people are like, yeah, we really don't want the United States militarizing space because that is apart from that international treaty, just blatantly illegal. And then on top of that is, you know, this denaturalization thing. All they're thinking is that like all the United States is doing is attacking all of its brown and non-white people. It's pretty much what they're doing here. Because like the denaturalization idea, the people that are going to be affected, one of the biggest, best examples I've heard of, there's a guy who's a PhD candidate. He is, uh, he's an Asian man and he is in the military uh, I believe he was National Guard or he was in the Army Reserve and he's he wants to be an officer. He's Chinese. And like they, they basically just told him, like, sorry, pal, you're on your way out of here. And I, I mean, they're taking this person who is he's a Ph.D. candidate, like he's finishing his Ph.D. That's not the kind of person that the United States is going to be saying, well, he may have made a mistake on his his application form, so he's got to go. Those are the people you want to keep in this country because once they get their jobs, they don't always go back. They usually innovate and create new industries and new technologies. I mean, those are the minds and the immigrants that you want to have in there. They went through the process. They got okayed. And and we're attacking that now for like, you know, typos and errors like that. This this is a this is like a middle class attack on um, immigration now. Like yeah. we've we've already 
we've already attacked all the poor people at the border. We separated and ripped their kids from their arms. Now we're attacking the ones that are going to college. Like this is an attack on, on all the other non white Christians. That's what I see here. And you know, you, you know, one of the funny thing here, like and we all talk about, you know, what's going on. I, I actually have a personalized endeavor into this, right? You know, my uncle is from Nigeria. Oh yeah, that's right. He, came here, you know, on the green card, got his degree, got a higher level degree at MSU, go Wolverines, and no molesters. <laughs> and wait, um wait. M- MSU is uh the molesters say the, the Spartans. Yeah, that, that that's not yeah, the Spartans not the Wolverines. That's Michigan. Yeah. Either way, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm, ta- I'm, ta- I'm talking, you know, sports ball and I know you, not all the time yeah. you buy into that. <laughs> but you know, um I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, you know, my uh, but this affects me personally, you know, and I, I honestly my uncle doesn't have a Facebook and I'm actually tempted to reach out to my aunt just to ask her her thoughts, because it, typically they're actually more liberal anyway, the, that specific unit in the family. But it's just really weird because, you know, he he's been here. So I think my cousin is 26 years old, so he's been here for over 30 years. He's never gone back to live in his country and share what he knows. He has his is doctoral he a, degree. He's a scientist, for Christ's sake. That's what he does for a living in Chicago. Is he is he a fully fledged citizen, yeah. or is he just a green card holder? No, nope, so fully, he's a U.S. citizen. He is now, but he's okay. What they're talking yeah. about—that's him. I he know. became I naturalized, know. and and you know he's somebody that contributes a high amount of value to society. He has three kids. His wife um is is pretty much has a great job and pays you know? the taxes. Yeah, they all pay the taxes. They're all, you know, these things. And it was kind of funny because, you know, people were like, yeah, you know, this will never be a witch hunt. But it almost, you know, and maybe this is conspiratorial of me, but I, it kind of feels a little, he's a Democrat, right? They're both registered Democrats. And I guarantee you, he's somewhat being targeted. I mean, and, and I, yeah. I, I am reaching out to her this week to just say, hey, you know, if, if he wants to come on the show, I'll be happy to have him on the show. You know, I'm sure he probably does, does cool. not want to just because no. you know, we're a secular <laughs> I don't show think so. and they're Christians. But, <laughs> you know. He's the well, I'm trying, people that's I'm trying being to targeted. Get, I'm trying to get the guy, um, Fred Wooden, who is running in the third congressional district against Justin Amash. I've been trying to get him to come on, and I talked to a couple people on his and see if they want to. You know, it's the secular thing, but they do need to reach out and talk to us. And so, like your your uh, your family member there, he's not specifically have any need to to talk. But like, I mean, if you sent if we sent him or we sent any of these other people that would be interested to be on the show, like some of our episodes that are that are pretty good, where we were like good boys and we weren't bad, and then they would listen to it and be like, oh, those guys are on, aren't too bad. And then they would flip over like a King Trump episode, and then they would be like, oh no, <laughs> what have I done? So like, I mean, he might be cool if, if if he listened to some of our more um, calm and constructive conversations. Yeah, I, you're you're right. He probably would. I, I just you know I won't out anybody that doesn't want to be outed. That's why we're not gonna. You know, I'm too. not gonna say his yeah. you know name. But this is this is pretty shocking to me. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I get I get some of the pandering he's got to do, right? But it almost kind of feels like I'm being screwed by somebody that's following GOP political endeavors. You know, such as what we'll talk about later with you know his nomination pick, right? I I feel, you know, that's a GOP, you know, move. And in this instance, this is not specifically GOP. This is, you know, pretty radical. Um, And this is part of his radical platform. You know, like Trump yeah, this- is not all GOP. Like he had a weird radical platform, which is part of the reason why he got elected is because he was able to buy into both camps. He had the radical side of things who didn't always agree with party lines. And then he had the party lines saying, hey, you know, we're going to sponsor you because we think you're going to get these other votes, plus you can have our votes, but you're going to do a few things for us, which, we'll, again, we'll talk about later. But this denaturalization thing is, is something that's, that's, that's pretty far off, in my opinion, from both parties. And I, I don't understand why nobody's protesting this more um, at all. I just, I, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's getting me. over it. It's getting overshadowed by the Supreme Court. I mean, it really is like this. This the whole idea of denaturalization task force. Somebody, a team of people that go in and look for people that may have had white lied, or done little things, or tried to push it, or maybe made their resume better. Because who hasn't done that, right? 
anyways, um, I mean, it, it, it's only your life, right? You're trying to get into the, probably one of the most prominent countries in the world uh, in the declining state of it. But either way, it's still in leaps and bounds better than a lot of other countries out there that people are coming from. And so they just do what they can. They just push as hard as they can on that naturalization rem, uh, resume, right? And so, like, these people are just – they're cleric look, looking for people who buff their, their resume to try to get a really good job. That's, that's what's happening here. And so when you are talking about the people who would support this, this is Trump appeasing his base. This is the base who is rabid and, and angry uh, about the immigration. And all you got to do is just say you're putting up a wall. Say you're, you're – you are prosecuting every single family that comes across the border. Say you're going after anyone who didn't do it perfectly, buy the book, spend every single moment doing exactly what they should. They love that. And then on the other end, like what you said with the GOP, Trump is the most perfectly GOP candidate that has been around in quite a while. I mean, if you think about every single legislative thing, he's done exactly what the GOP wanted to do with the taxes and stuff. He didn't quite support the tax bill as good as he should have. But I mean, because he didn't want to be on a losing side. Trump doesn't he he hedges his bets until the very end so that he always picks a winner. He tried that with Roy Jones and got hosed. So he's been even more rescinding on that. But like all the Supreme Court picks, he doesn't know who's a good judge and who's not a good judge. He just takes what the Heritage Foundation gives him. I mean, he just he really does. The Federalist Society, those are whoever they say is best is because that's that was that was the people that were in his in his list for Supreme Court. And all of these judicial appointments that Mitch McConnell has been going pushing through that he restricted against uh, um, Obama, all of this stuff. Trump isn't paying attention to that. He has no idea who any of these people are. He's just doing what the GOP tells him, and then he goes out. So he he appeases the the intelligentsia in the base, and he appeases his you know, rabid base who love to just attack immigrants and think that brown people are coming for all their jobs when it's really just the richest people in the country sucking all the resources out of the country. Like th those are the two groups he's appeasing with this. And he, I mean, this, this is a direct thing like that. He's appeasing the base with this. And this is terrible. This is, I mean, this is attacking really good people who a lot of military cases that there, there are genuine uh, guys who join the military because they had a promise of eventually getting a citizenship after three or four years, they're getting kicked out and deported. Like, there's a bunch yeah. of cases for that. It's unbelievable that we would take somebody who risks their lives and sacrifice what could have been their life and then kick them out after a few years of their service. It's just disgusting. Yeah. And and here we are saying, hey, we're going to promote veterans. We're supporting the military. Yeah. We're investing millions of dollars. But here we have articles, you know, I mean, NPR has this article about discharging immigrant recruits, like you just were saying. Yeah. It's it's insanity to me, to me. Like this is a bizarre world, man. Like we it's went hypocrisy. from hypocrisy. It is it is genuine hypocrisy. Yeah, how how they attack veterans, but they say they love the G the veterans too. Like, exactly. Whatever. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I mean, and you know, it's kind of funny because you know we had a friend that is a veteran, and you know, on disability and on you know, essentially getting the government's insurance, and he supported Trump. Because supposedly Trump's going to be better for VA insurance. There's yeah, been no he wants change. To privatize it. Yeah. yeah, he's been trying. He's been he and Paul Ryan have been trying to privatize it. Exactly. And even <laughs> even if you think privatization is better, you're there's no way you're going to think VA privatization is any better than what it's going to be. Your taxes are going to go up. They're going to bill somebody for this. If they can bill out, <laughs> yeah. you know, if they, you know, oh hey you have a common cold, that's a seven hundred dollar bill. And, oh, that's what's acceptable by the market? Okay. That's ridiculous, right? You know, like, that's that's where capitalism that's get, fails. That's and, why you can get a $5,000 MRI nowadays. Yes. It's, un, it's, un, it's unrestricted. It's like, what's your deductible? $5,000. Okay, well, that's what the test is going to cost. It's one test. Yeah, well, we're just going to fill up your deductible right out of the gate. So you're saying if I get a brain scan in an hour, it costs me $5,000. They're like, yeah, why not? It, it's that insane for medical. And so you want to privatize and make the military have to go deal with those guys who are for profit, like vastly and intensely for profit. You're going to get hosed even worse and it's going to cost even more money. I don't understand why they don't. The same thing happens with the roads. They talk about, oh, we'll privatize the roads. Yeah. Well, that means that you're going to have a pole road, a toll road everywhere. Everywhere yeah. you go is going to be a toll road. Yeah. And, and you know, I have a, a personal story with privatized medicine. You know that I went to the hospital in the middle of the night. Uh, for symptoms that portrayed a heart attack, right? And the doctor I saw when I got to the hospital, 
was a third party contractor, right? It was the the essentially the hospital paid um this guy to come in here and then they charge you on a separate bill and it comes from this company that looks ridiculous, like a fake company, like their yeah. website's not that very good, you know, any of those other things. And you know, like so I refuse to pay the bill. I call the hospital, say, Hey, can you lump all my bills together? They sure, hey, no problem, we got it all. Two years later, I'm being sued in court because I owe seven hundred and fifty dollars. And I'm sitting here going, what, what are you talking about? Do the research, call Spectrum up. They're like, Well, yeah, we lumped all the ones we could together, but that's third party that bills through their system. Yeah, Think for, about our, that. for our pregnancy, we got a couple of weird bills from weird places and we had to double check to make sure where that we were paying we weren't paying just some weird middleman who was just sending us a bill for nothing at all. Yeah. Like, you really do have to pay attention to what you're doing when it comes to bills like that. Yeah, and I would about, think, think that, you know, it, that that would just be bad. And then like even tying that into any kind of other privatization stuff, it's just all going to turn into who can make the most money out of it. Not like which military guys are immigrants that are working their asses off for you. That's that's not their goal. It's how can we get the most money? Like that's that that is what a pro, a, a corporation is designed for to make money, not to be altruistic and take care of people. Yeah. And we sit, we sit around here and we have all those different issues and then we turn around and, you know, like I said, the NPR article that you know, one of the ones that I posted, you know, and maybe we're just over NPR, you know, heavy this week. But one of the ones I posted They've been really is, good lately. Is, is about this gentleman who essentially wanted to dedicate his life to the army, like we were talking about earlier. And, you know, and it's kind of funny because the the NPR article calls out his regular attendance to, this, to Christian church. And it's like, I don't care about that, you know, but. I'm sure there's lots of yeah. people that do, you know, I'm sure there's lots of people that listen to this that are like, yeah. And and if you think about it, all that a that, that shows two things. One, it shows the fact that the world is still viewing the U S as a Christian nation. And so the, to the fact that a national news organization has to point out the fact that this guy was a regular Christian church attender and he's, and he's you know, still being attacked and he's still being attacked. And, and that's the insane be- part of this. Why is this guy, why is people like this being attacked? I mean, he's, I I won't put any stock in his Christian church BS. I don't care about that, right? You know, but a lot of people do put stock in it. But you sit there and go, he's yeah. definitely not buying into any religion that believes in blowing themselves up inside of other people's, you know, religious buildings. He's not buying into and he's, suicide cults. He's doing everything, he's doing everything by the book as best he can. He made some clerical error somewhere. Yeah. And he's and he's 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 not a white person. I mean, it really is like this us versus them trying to keep that. There was a, a poll that just came out this this week about um, something like 47 percent. Of uh, Americans are not proud of the direction that the United States is going and something like 30 percent of Democrats said that it's not important that they have European heritage, but something like 60, 65 percent of the GOP uh, base said that it's important that they support and and uh, protect their European heritage, which is th- this is based that that's just a nice way of saying that they support and want to protect whiteness in the United States, and that's part of where this is coming from. Is like the base itself has a xenophobic tendency towards any other culture besides a white Euro Caucasian whatever, and like these are this is the manifestation of those of those kinds of, of those kinds of physical, uh, um, you know, abhorrencies and, and the uh, philosophy that the that the GOP kind of has turned into now. Like they're no longer the American conservatives. They are the Tea Party wing. They are Donald Trump's party, which has these these groups of people that want to apparently attack what I would call someone who would be a model citizen if given the chance. Yeah, exactly. And I pulled up the or the USCIS website for their official post, right? And he they, they say this, they're revising their policies um, requiring the USCIS to issue an NTA, which is a notice to appear yep. in the following categories of cases in which the individual is removable. And they literally say individuals removable. I mean, it's like right there. In their blog. Yeah. I should take a screenshot of this because I bet this will not exist in like two years when <laughs> Hitler Trump takes over. But they, they, mm-hmm. they talk about, they say this, they say cases where fraud or misrepresentation is sustained and or where an applicant abused any program 
related to the recipients of public benefits. They will issue an NTA even in the case is denied for reasons other than fraud. So they literally say, well, if you were fraudulent, we're going to go after you, but we're going to issue an NTA even if your case is denied for reasons other than fraud. Like, yeah. you're, you're still going to get it. You're going to get an NTA. It, <laughs> it doesn't matter what we what you do, you're going to get this. Yeah, if you did something wrong, like significantly wrong, obviously that is, a you know, it's ground for some kind of a punishment. I don't know if that's enough punishment to kick you out of the country entirely, but for someone who wants the border to be this iron fence, this iron curtain, that sounds awfully Soviet, doesn't it? Anyways, if they want it to be, you know, that intensely harsh, then yeah, they're going to love the idea of, you know, kicking people out for, for you know, faking on some of their stuff or taking the... Um, taking benefits when they probably weren't completely and totally eligible for it. That's yeah. a place where I can see it. But like, if they have some weird nitpick, like you said that you were in this country for four years, but you were actually there for six because we spent a hundred thousand dollars doing background research to find this out so we can kick you out. Like just uh, those kinds of things would, that would make me sad that that's, that's the low depths that they're, they're going to, to kick look, people look, out. Even, even if, it, it, even if it's because they took benefits for health insurance early, if that's why you're kicking them out, we've got a problem here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a problem to me. You know, like I get the, it. You're the breaking would the law, support that. but that's like yeah, the Jeff base. Sessions saying you smoke pot, you're going to hell or, <laughs> well, I don't know. Did he say, that? I think he said that, you know, anyway, <laughs> but he says no good, no good people smoke marijuana. Exactly. They, but that's the thing. The problem with these are they're so broad. They talk about this. They, they also say this, they say criminal cases where applicant is convicted of or charged with a criminal offense. So they, they put in there if you're charged with a criminal offense. Yeah, that's enough. Or has it, committed acts that are chargeable as a criminal offense. Now wait, why even put that in there? Like oh, nobody cares if you're if you've committed acts that are chargeable, you should have been charged. If you're not, then it's not wrong. So it'd be like if you went, Hannah. I guess you're not you're not a minority, but all right. Let's say our friend <laughs> Mohammed went. And he jaywalked, right? He could be charged with a criminal offense, but he they wasn't because the cop ignored it. But they're going to be like, ah, you've got foreign descent. Therefore, we're going to get rid of you because you should maybe. have been charged. That's what that's leaving that open to say. Or I mean, in some I cases, know there's more technical people... words, but that's, doesn't, that, doesn't that feel like that's what they're leaving it open to say? Well, kind of sometimes when you get in trouble, they'll waive all the charges if you just do community service right out of the gate. And so, like, you know, they just we're, we're getting rid of all the charges as long as you do six months of um, some kind of voluntary service, something like that. So in some cases, like if you get a, a traffic infraction, you get into a car accident, instead of, you know, paying a fine or whatever, they'll say, we will waive all the charges against you. You have to do six weeks of of you know volunteer service or something like that so that's probably what they're trying to talk to you so like even if you if you did something bad and you managed to create a deal with the law that you could skip out on some kind of charges. That was a chargeable offense, though. If you didn't get charged for it, you, you broke. You made some kind of a deal, you're still getting kicked out of the country. Yeah, and it goes back to even more farther from that, and basically, you know, it says, even if the criminal conduct was not the basis for the denial of the ground of removability. So let's say they get caught smoking a joint. They can go, criminal offense, boom, bye-bye. That's insanity yeah. to me. That's literally well, like saying, hey, if you walk down the road and we make a law about it and you violate that law, hey, if they make a law saying no brown people can walk down the road and a brown person walks down the road, they can get rid of them. That's what that's saying. And again, yeah, zero, I'm not a law expert, man. but that's what their announcement is. It's zero tolerance, and it's basically requiring anybody coming into this country to be absolutely perfect, which is, you know, it's an unreasonable requirement. It is. Nobody's I, perfect. I disagree with you. I don't think it's requiring them to be Perfect. What I'm telling you is that it means that they get to choose or, yeah. when they want to expel somebody. It has nothing to do with how they feel. It's just like, yep, we're going to get rid of them. Bye bye. See you. We don't like you for whatever fucking reason. And it, and it reminds me of, you know, that show, The Americans, that is a little controversial. You know, I mean, that's what it reminds me of. That's what America is becoming. We can make things happen and make people disappear without question. Yeah, unfortunately, that does seem to be that way. That's why you vote. That's why all these, um, the people out there who say like, I don't really, I don't really care about you know whatever. I vote, in the, but I don't pay attention to politics or something like that. Like, 
Uh, yeah, that's fine. Let me know in 10 years when the Supreme Court has struck down every single gay rights and every single uh, women's re- uh, birth control freedoms and let me know how that apathy worked for you. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's like the Republicans get out and vote in every single election. They get out and vote in midterms. They get out and vote in off years. They get out and vote for their governors, their mayors, their city clerks. I mean, they get out and do it because they understand the importance of it. And look at this. They have total control over just about everything and they're wreaking havoc with democracy. Uh, time to get involved. <laughs> it's just, I, uh, Next. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> we've we've had enough of that. We've yeah, had, we've had just, enough of that. That 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 one's kind of depressing. I think I think it's going to be a little bit better after that, though, for the for the next topic. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those where we took a week off as a distraction, and we come back, and it's it doesn't matter what you do. You, there's no escaping it. There's I yeah, got too many alerts. Cycle. It's just it just is. And you know, so while we're doing that, right? Here we are taking our kids to the Grand Rapids Public Museum and <laughs> we're able to, you know, talk through and see different things that are amazing. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things. I don't know. Did you go see the um, they've had a couple of exhibits, the new ones, the uh, Mar mission to Mars, I think. Or is I have NASA not been one? in there for that one yet. Yeah, I haven't been into that one yet. They've, they've had like the permanent um, NASA stuff that is for the uh, the. Um, the guys in Michigan or from Michigan who are from West Michigan, I guess that had, uh, Roger B. Chaffee, Chaffee, Roger B. Chaff, Chaffee. I don't know. I'm not sure how to say his last name, but he was, uh, an astronaut. I think it was on one of the Apollo missions. So like the U S they've got like a permanent thing for NASA there, but I haven't, when I was there, it was the, uh, the dragons, unicorns, and mermaids. And then it was this, uh, this germ thing where they talked about how germs and bugs and like, like bugs, like microscopic creatures, uh, are on your skin and how they kind of move around. Those are the two, like, and you know the um the uh, visiting things were, and then the rest of the the permanent stuff was there. Yeah, well, you know, we actually it's kind of funny. We went. Uh, I took uh, my kids there last week, or the week before. I can't remember. Last week yeah. or the week before, I took them there, and then you know we we also saw the dragons, unicorns, and mermaids, probably for a different reason than you did. But in <laughs> fairness, my daughter's obsessed with dragons. I'm kind of obsessed with dragons too. And so it was kind of a no brainer. We had to go. Like it was not yeah. even a question. the The shittiest thing about that was that the dragons were at the end of the exhibit, or like and there's one point, big giant one when you walk in. But yeah, well, exactly. You had the giant one, and then it did all these other things. By the time we got to the end, I read through all of them. My kids are bored. They're like, "Dad, yeah. stop reading this!" And they're like, "No, no, no! This is the best part right here. This is the part I like the most." And they're like, "Yeah, we like dragons too, but uh, can we go get a slushy or can we?" we had planetarium tickets ironically enough um that we went to after that because i just <laughs> i bought a membership so i was like well screw it you know at some point how do i support the arts you know i donate a lot of money to social work causes but i gotta support the arts at some point and you know i've been to the gr art museum and i just is not the same kick as going to the public museum it's just not i i don't i it maybe it's the planetarium that does it for me i don't know yeah, but that's the I best part about I it. Really... You get free planetarium tickets man yeah, it is pretty sweet. Uh, we, we, I will say that for West Michigan, um, being it's conservative, and uh, uh, I, I would guarantee you the number of people in the area who are full-on creationists is pretty high. They do have some really good science and art facilities, and I think that's probably because of the high tax base. There's just a lot of money in the area for you know tax money from people that just – have money (laughs) so like we have we have a pretty strong tax base that allows us to fund these these uh public museums and and i was i i was really interested in the dragons unicorns and mermaids thing more so because of what i had i had heard about it was that it's kind of explaining how humans created these things and so I, you went in basically your kids like dragons and i was like yeah that's cool let's go see the the wild sculptures and the weird stuff and um, a, an immediate realization that what they were doing was like what they had done with the whale exhibit a few months ahead of that was that they talked about how whales came into existence by going over their entire evolutionary history from the land-based mammals 
up into the, the, the hip bones and legs receding into the whale blubber so that they could be full-time aquatic creatures again. I did a wonderful job explaining that. And then in this dragons, unicorns, and mermaid thing, the one that really got me the most, like reading through it, was that they had um, they had displays of elephant skulls. And an elephant skull has this huge opening in the center of it for the nose, for the, the long trunk and where all of the, the nasal control and all that stuff is. And if you look at that skull, the eyes are way off on the side. They could look like ear holes. And so yeah. if you look at that skull, the side holes look kind of like ear holes. And there's this giant hole in the middle. And if someone said, that's a cyclops skull, you'd be like, no way. You know what I mean? Like It's one of those things that I was just like, that's and th- that th- what they believe is that they were – um, uh, ancestors to you know modern elephants, so things along the lines of, of mammoths and and something of the, that nature that were found by ancient Greek cultures. That were you know they found these bones and they immediately created these uh, like this has to be a one-eyed giant. They found a giant leg bone and you know a, a skull and they're like this has to be a giant one-eyed man, and they created you know mythology from it. And they had some they have this little tiny thing of history that was real. And they, and you know, the human mind, as simple as it was at the time, thinking that it took a man in a chariot to pull, or a god in a chariot to pull the sun across the sky every day, like that was what they had, and so they created a cyclops because that was where the human mind was at that point. That was really cool. I wasn't ready for that, and I, I, I took pictures of it, and I got yelled at, and I didn't care, and I said, "I'm taking that with me." <laughs> wow, you got yelled at? I didn't get yelled at for my pictures. Well, they sometimes they complain about taking pictures in museums, and the guy was like, "Can you please just just not take pictures of that, place, please?" And I was just like, "Ah, oh, come on, man." Maybe it's so because you're Jewish. He, you know, maybe he's a <laughs> Trumpite, and he's like, "Hey, hey, that guy's a Jew, so I'm I'm going after him." Oh, that's one of the most frustrating things. Is like I am completely <laughs> and totally a non-believer, and they're like, "Was your mom a believer?" Like, yeah, my mom's Jewish. Like, then you're a Jew. It's like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, a religion isn't hereditary. Although they, you know, there are people, people that would argue that. that but no, and, <sighs> but anyway, and, and the dragon, the and the dragon thing was cool too. That was the Asian stuff, though. So, like, did you like where that went? Oh, oh, I loved it. You know, it was it, I, I love the history side of the things. You know, in like the whole mythology thing. Like going back through that, just you know, reminds me. It, it makes me reminiscent of different books, uh, fantasy books I read. You know, now of course, fantasy books, you know, go a little bit farther with magic and all these other gibberish too. <laughs> yeah. But a little bit, a little bit. It brings back that story, and and you know you look at that Chinese culture, right? And yeah. it's amazing. And 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 the best part about it is how they basically are like, well, you know, this isn't just Chinese culture, right? Oh it's yeah, not. it's, it's, it's like, out through it. It's yeah. through the whole world, mm-hmm. and they could pinpoint dragons as an evolutionary time point. And even though they don't make a big thing about that, to me, that was actually the biggest um, attractor to that exhibit. Is I could watch it you know, evolve and move through countries and spread kind of like a religious disease, you know, like Christianity did. And I could see yep. the same different things. And and the difference is I like dragons better. I like the mythology better <laughs> than I do Christianity. But, you know, you you can see the the concepts and, and the flow of ideas and how it's not just this one group of people that made this decision. It's like these people that collectively decided this and it kind of just continued to spread and pick up you know, popularity like a, a meme does. And I love, I love how they, they somehow based it on something real. So like that, that's what like the bone thing is the biggest for me was that the one that I remember the most is that, uh, they talked about, uh, I think his name was Chan Ku or Chang Zhu. Uh, he's a Chinese historian from the fourth century. He mislabeled a fossil in, uh, in the Sichuan province. And, uh, it was a fossilized stegosaurus. And so when he looked at this thing at 30 feet in length or whatever, 14 feet tall, he, he was basically, you know, he, he they, they were in the fourth century. This is a long time ago. And they were mislabeling these things. So th- this is, a, you know, it's it, th- there's a complete and total explanation for it. We have an evolutionary history of that bone and that series of bone and that fossil that that guy found. But at the time, they didn't know. And so they, they'd love to make these, you know, educated guesses. But when it, when it comes, when, like, when you go really far back into history, it's not an educated guess. It is just simply a guess. And, you know, the game of telephone can grow long and wide. 
I just I like seeing how like there's this weird thing that now when we look at that we're like there's no way that's a mythical creature that's just a stegosaurus, but like they didn't know at the time and so that's how you create religions it's like this bubble of ignorance that slowly gets chipped away and eventually they can cast that aside. Hopefully, hopefully, and 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 you know I don't know I I just I love that museum we go quite a bit in fairness and they get my membership every year. Like they just, they have for the last four years we've had a membership there. Um, yeah. The Grand Rapids public museum is worth every penny. If you have a membership for it, I had the children's museum for a while because my daughter was too young to really appreciate it. But like, I mean, if, right when you walk in, they have a giant, um, it's a, it's a blue whale that's above, or is it a humpback? Yeah. I can't, uh, it's, I a blue whale. it's a blue whale. And they, they had the vestigial hips in there. So you can see them. They're hanging. That's a beautiful thing. And they have Archaeopteryx right in the, right when you walk in just to the right in the main hallway. It's it's a beautiful place. I love it. Um, one other thing on the, the, the fossilized thing, though, is that like I talked about casting it aside. And uh, so, like, as we you know moved on through society and got more intelligent, this whole thing, like, casting these these myths aside, there is there is no Cyclops. We know that it is an elephant ancestor and so like we have scientists who looked at it and said okay that was wrong our assumptions were wrong we need to not do that anymore here's the real thing and now we all believe that thing uh what happened in um in in israel with uh israelites uh the, the and anthropologist and uh um and um the uh, archaeologists and people who were they're looking for proof of their faith in those hills, and they didn't find any. There's a bunch of examples where they found that the kingdom of David was really small. It's not nearly as big and wide and grandeur as uh, as explained in the Bible, and they found that the Exodus, there's no evidence that it took 40-something years. And we don't even need to get started on all the times they've been trying to chase down whether or not the Noah's Ark actually landed on Mount Sinai and is still somewhere sitting there. All, all those things, scientists and, sci- and archaeologists and, and historians have said consistently that the evidence is low, if at all. And so and more than more than likely, a lot of these things that are in the Bible are, are exaggerated or, or uh, overstated. And we don't cast those aside. Or maybe we are, it's just really slow. But like we, it, doesn't, it seems like we can look at, at the science and say, yes, elephants are not mythical beasts. But <clears throat> excuse me, we can't look at um, the, these tiny little um, villages that we found here are you know maybe a couple thousand people. That's not this massive rolling kingdom of Israel that that we all uh, read about in the Bible. But we can't push those aside and knock those out with that evidence. So that's it's so like I'm I'm hoping that this dragon's unicorn thing is like a nice example for how the future should turn. But I mean, I don't know. I I can't see that far in advance, and I can't see human evolution happening. So I guess we're kind of stuck with this uh, short term view. Exactly. But don't let our trips to the museum distract you from the worst, I don't know, I'm going to call it the nail in the coffin, because <laughs> I don't know what oh, else man. to call it. I mean, we, it will be, we talked about be denaturalization, gets... and that's, <laughs> that's pretty disgusting. I mean, I'm sorry, like, we we talked about that, and there's something even worse that is happening, even worse than that. That's actually happening. And that is Trump. Well, let's go back. Somebody's retiring from the Supreme Court. Yeah, thanks, bro. Somebody is. I won't even try and pronounce his name, but I'm telling you right now. It's just Kennedy. Joseph Kennedy. He's the guy that's uh, he's retiring. Okay. And the new dude is Brett Kavanaugh. And yep. then I'm trying to I'm trying to find the other um, nominees. There was like a short list. But here's the thing: even before we talk about the nomination, we we could talk about Kennedy retiring and why it's more detrimental in different re- for different reasons. I guess the big thing here is we have a justice retiring who is conservative, has voted conservative many a times, but is actually putting out a more moderate. Uh, I, I don't know what they call it, like the discussion points, right, of their decisions. And that's actually the, dis- the larger yeah. hit here, is that we're not just losing a judge to be replaced by an ultra-conservative, if that's what we determine this guy to be. We have a judge that has voted, we'll call it neocon, 
because that's the nicest way to say it. He's he's yeah. kind of like a Hillary Clinton, you know, and I know people don't like to reference him like that, but he votes similar to how Hillary Clinton has voted in the past. Yeah, I would say he is actually, I mean, in that same area, he is just center right who has tendencies to swing hard for certain things when it comes to business. He was the main swing vote for Citizens United, which is a horrifyingly GOP conservative and disgusting thing that, that basically made our politics pay for play. But like he also swings for the liberal side when it comes to um, human rights and, and gay and lesbian rights. So like the GOP political side for money and econo- economic stuff, he's hardcore. And then for like basic human rights and stuff like that, he's he's a little bit more towards a centrist space. Yeah. And that's that's actually, in my opinion, almost a greater tragedy than whoever they elect to it. Now, I mean, I guess if they were like, yeah, hey, we're going to elect a white supremacist, um, you know, Christian who believes that the end times are happening right now. <laughs> All right, fine. You know, I mean, if they invited, you know, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church into the Supreme Court, I would be a little bit more concerned. But we're the bigger thing here. We're losing somebody that was detrimental um, in, in his, you know, discussions is afterwards. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Ed Brayton mentioned this and then. I didn't know this. I guess this wasn't something I was readily available at my fingertips, but Ed was talking uh, in one of his recent blogs that you can find in the links of the, the conversation here that we have at Seller Skeptics. But, you know, Ed was like talking about how this justice is more important because of the dissensions he writes, you know? Yeah. Yep. And, and that's the bigger thing here. You know, even though you and I probably don't agree with 90% of his decisions, his dissensions were closer to that middle ground than anybody else's were. For example, the cake, the, the gay uh, cake baker or uh, the anti-gay cake baker, whatever they, what, we had this episode <laughs> yeah. three weeks ago. And yep. you know, his, his dissent was completely different than what a geo, a standard GOP dissent would have been. And that's a bigger loss, I think for us than anything else. Yeah, his dissension essentially was, um, you know, is kind of is a realization that um, what what was doing, what everybody was saying was happening was basically the uh, that the um, this was like you know is a judicial process error that essentially that was the reason why the court found in his favor. But Kennedy was saying that this this does have larger implications to what everybody thinks. Like you can try to keep it as small and as constricted as you can, but it's going to be a lot bigger. It's going to be it's going to be a lot more important and a lot more ground shaking than uh, than what they were trying to keep it. They were trying to keep it just that the guy was basically not treated very well, so he should have uh, he he should be able to do what he wanted to do. And so like, but that the implications were 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 more important than that. Kennedy has a tendency to do that. His dissents were pretty important when it came to uh, to finding a good spot in the middle. Like he he often found himself um, going against Justice Scalia, and um, and weirdly enough, siding with uh, Justice Ginsburg on a lot of um, uh, women's rights and human rights stuff. Which that's the, the the he was the swing vote. You could say he was probably presidents aside. He was the most important person in the United States, the most powerful man in this country, because he had four conservatives and four liberals on each side. And depending on what the concept was, he would swing to the either. And so he really did make some of the biggest decisions in the history of this entire country for 30 something years. Like he is a big deal. And in his leaving, like there are things to love and hate about the guy. But what we're going to be getting almost certainly is a blind, clear-cut, no-question conservative. So there's no swing anymore. It is going to be 100% five conservative to four liberal. That's the big fear that, that we're going to be having here. And then there's some liberal, I guess, places where the, the Democrats would swing to the uh, swing to the conservative side as well. And so, like, I mean, you could be looking at 6-3 decisions that are going to be showing up that you would not have expected. Yeah, and we can get into the Roe versus Wade, what's going to get overturned, where we could go with this speculation, but I don't want to do that tonight. I think I think we should save yeah. that till pretty much the Senate and the House have basically said, "Yeah, we're going to support this." When we hit yeah, that, one, one, once we'll it's not, once that. the nomination once the nomination is confirmed, then we can start worrying about you know, because the hope the hope really here is that something throws a wrench in the plans that this confirmation does not happen as fast as they want it to, and that. 
uh, something gets scuttled and ruined and then it goes to pass the uh, the midterms. And hopefully the Democrats can pick up enough seats that they can force this to be a bipartisan selection as opposed to only a uh, partisan selection due to the, uh, the the GOP taking the nuclear option, getting rid of the filibuster for nominations. That's what they did with Gorsuch. It's only Republicans that voted and uh, Mike Pence broke the tie. That's how Gorsuch got nominated. Uh, but there were three Democrats who voted for him. Uh, so like they're, they're, they're those three Democrats, um, uh, I can't remember uh, their names. It's Kathy something, Joe Kelly. I can't remember their names right now. But they uh, they have also they're in de- they're in red states and they're trying to get reelected. And this is this is something we will talk about because I have a couple of topics that uh, I want to cover on those guys. But so Brett Kavanaugh. He got the nomination. He he is he is their guy so far. So like, where do you want? Dude. So so the big thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise everybody. I want to pick a Fox News article, right? And we're gonna cover what this guy's about in a second. But Fox News has this. Essentially, he has this discussion. They have this discussion where they say, "Who is Brent Kavanaugh? Five things to know about Trump's Supreme Court pick." All right. Yeah. I'm I'm hooked. Let's have a conversation. You know, <laughs> you got the clickbait. <laughs> I did. I did a little bit. Yeah, he's a 53 year old, which is important. Graduate of Yale Law School, not important, and a former law clerk to Kennedy in '93, who yep. was evaluated to the elevated. I'm sorry, to the most powerful federal appeals court in the District of Columbia by George W. Bush. Okay, so there, there's his, there's his initial background. Yeah, he's got a huge background. Like the yeah. guy's been in 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 Washington for something like twenty something years, almost thirty years, and that's a problem for the nomination is that the guy has written so much law and that re- everybody has to read all of his stuff. And if he has any time bombs that he didn't tell anyone about that that get discovered, that's a wrench. That's that's what we're hoping for. So there are Democratic clerks and Democratic page boys and girls that are just buried in paper trying to find something that can really criminalize this guy yep exactly so they say here's the five things to know and uh, i i will literally quote this and i i guess this shouldn't be surprised because it's fox news but he's yeah their first point is he worked on the investigation that led to president clinton's impeachment yeah i like, yeah, got he, he, like, he worked under but, ken Starr. that's one of his big p- career points he, but but why is this relevant for Supreme Court pick? I don't because understand it's, it. it. It's Washington service. Like it's something that he has done in Washington. So anything that you do as a um, public official. So like if you're, uh, you know, if you're doing law in Washington as like a private law lawyer, that's not really relevant. It is to a certain degree, but it's not really that relevant. But he's been in like he's been in the U.S. government for a long time, and everything he did in the U.S. government has to be tracked and kept record of. So there are really good records of every single thing he's done. So the guy has a huge paper trail, and if there are any holes in it, it it'll be easy to find because the government requires you to keep records of that stuff. Like it's like the you hear the stories about Donald Trump ripping up memos and then the poor the poor uh, interns have to tape them back together because he's an idiot and he doesn't realize that every single thing that he touches, scribbles, or writes on has to be kept for posterity. But like everything that these judges do and everything that they do when they're a clerk or whatever has to be kept track of too. And so this guy has a huge paper trail and they're saying that this could, it could be a great thing or a terrible thing. And uh, hopefully it's a terrible thing so we can push this stuff back to after the midterm. Yep. And another thing that they say, the second one was it's unclear how he would rule on abortion, right? It's unclear. Bullshit. Bull. And, hold on. Hold on. So they claim, <laughs> this is what they claim. They claim that he allowed a pregnant teenage illegal immigrant under federal custody to have an abortion. Yep. That's what that they just happened the other day. Yeah. It, yeah, that just happened the other day. That was a big thing. It was like the girl was, uh, she had been caught trying to cross the border and she wanted to get an abortion. And um, he apparently let it happen. I don't think he had a choice, really, but. Um, that was a big story for a little while because like they were trying to stop it, trying to stop it, trying to stop it, and he was one of the judges or the judge of the appeals court who said that no, she, the legal precedent says she can get this. Which that's the thing is like the whole point, the whole point of being a judge is to remove your political views from from the the case 
and judge on what the law says. And Kavanaugh, at an appellate position, has to abide by the ruling of the Supreme Court, which says that you cannot deny um, a uh, a woman an abortion. And uh, I, I guess there's, there's a bunch of gray areas, whether or not this woman is an American citizen, if she's in the U.S. territories, whatever the ruling was that uh, – like she basically ha- legally had the right to do it as a Supreme Court justice, he would have the ability to change that rule that would you know, that bound him when he was an appellate. It's like you know what I mean? It's like it's like you have to do what your boss says to you when you're in middle management, even if you think the, the middle management or that even if you think your boss is doing it completely wrong, you still have to do what you think is wrong until you become your boss, and then you can change that rule. So what they say is that because he allowed an abortion. Is not evidence to me that he would ever not go, uh, challenge Roe v. Wade because legally he was required to do so. He could be removed from the bench if he ignored the law intensely enough. That's why Roy Roy Jones uh, lost his job as a, a judge in uh, in Alabama be, before he ran for for governor recently. Like you have to do what the law says when you're an under judge, and when you're a Supreme Court judge, then you can set precedent for the whole country. Exactly. So that's why that whole thing, is you just sit there and go, it's kind of unclear. We know that he seems to lean far right in this decision. Well, he's, he's, he's just thinking of a choice. He's sponsored by the Federalist um, Society and the Heritage Foundation, two of the biggest Republican think tanks in the country. Like Those guys aren't going to give this guy their check of approval if he's not going to go against, you know, the, what's the one thing that Republicans can almost all get behind? is that they don't they want to stop abortion like i guarantee you if he's vetted by both those those uh organizations there's no way in hell that given the chance he would not shoot down roe v wade yeah the next one is it's he has close ties to the bush family like anybody gives a crap i'm sorry i, like, I don't i don't care like move <laughs> has, past has that he, point has he been shot by cheney i don't really what's yeah. the point here yeah don't get it <laughs> His the next point is he credits his mother for his career path. Again, who cares? I'm good for him. Yeah, it's, I'm yeah, glad it's he's great. giving credit for to somebody else. But I'm telling you that has nothing to do with why we should nominate him. If Hitler's like, yeah, my mom, she helped me kill a bunch of Jews. <laughs> everybody, everybody should like me because of that. We wouldn't like Hitler. We would go, no, 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 yeah. you're a, yeah. a a horrible human. And I'm not trying to compare Kavanaugh to the- to Hitler. Not, no, you don't. I'm, I'm putting the two know. words in the same sentence, but I'm not trying to actually God, compare. Godwin's law. Anything. Godwin's law was just was just uh, uh, utilized at the Celador Skeptics podcast and minute whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the um the whole thing about the mother thing is something they've really been pushing. So one of the big things that uh, this is not a woman that Trump is uh, nominee that Trump's appointing here as a nominee. And so what's the biggest problem that they've been having deals uh, to deal with in the GOP is the educated female voter. Like they're watching what the GOP is doing, what Trump is doing. They're not happy. I mean, they're bleeding women voters. At least they think they are. All the polls say they are. And so they brought this young man in, young as far as con- Supreme Court stuff is concerned. And so in his um, acceptance speech for the nomination, he immediately – he didn't talk about his law career or whatever. He said his mom was this really important woman that gave him – and she, he quoted her with, her favorite, with his favorite saying that she had. And I cannot remember for the life of me right now. But he talked about working and hiring uh, minorities and working for minorities. Like he basically gave them this, like, this, this warm, loving um, – I, I, I don't hate women. I don't hate – minorities i'm this this nice warm happy judge like he came out and he's controlling the narrative right out of the gate so like i i I, here's all these examples of why i'm not this monster that the media is going to say i am in these next few months or you know whatever and so like he he got to jump on that and fox is obviously going with that they're they're putting out the mom quotes they're putting out this the strength of the mom lawyer and saying like this is you know this this is proof that he is not this woman hater who wants to control women's women's uh, reproductive rights and you know, this is more just you know it's, it's controlling your narrative and fox is doing what all the other gop I, it's like they all got together and talked about it whether or not uh, this guy is going to be um, um supporting women enough exactly and the last point that they put in there was about the boston marathon i be like i i don't i don't understand why why this is even a discussion yeah he ran in the boston marathon 
He ran in two of them. Good for him. Did, what, what what does that did, have to do did, with anything? I'm sorry. Like again, it goes back he, to the mom thing. Like I get your point, and 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 we got to relate it to the women and how do we show and humanize with that? But how can you humanize being in the Boston Marathon with American public, Hannah? Well, did he run in the the one that that was bombed, and did he help people that were bleeding to death get out of the way? Like, what's the the relevance, like politically they, here? They, it's like, they it's an impressive he, thing he to run wins a regularly with his team in a charity race, and he regularly wins. That's that's what they're saying. Oh, and he volunteers just, and he teaches yeah. his daughter's base or basketball teams. And I, I don't, I mean, uh, well, this is just basically them trying to make this guy seem like a you know an everyman. That, that's all it really is. Like, I mean, we don't really need to know his general health. And like how involved in his kids' lives he is, as far as like what kind of a judge he would be. But once again, this is like I was saying a moment ago. It's like this is them trying to control the narrative, and make this guy as warm and fuzzy and 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 Cliff Hopstable minus the uh, the date rape drugs and, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, in all reality, that's that's really what it's going to be. It's like they're they're going to try to warm and fuzzy this guy up as much as he can until he's really given a chance to shine. Like Neil Gorsuch when um, Trump's travel ban came on. The first round through, Neil Gorsuch said, "I wanted to, I wanted to shut down the border yesterday." Like he was like, I'll, "I'll vote for this thing in five minutes," and like had to go through all the appellate courts and all that. But like Gorsuch was quoted saying that he's like, I, "I'll, I'll vote, I will support this this travel ban immediately," and um, it it took to the third uh, iteration of the travel ban before he was even able to say anything. But I mean, they really had to they had to support it, and Gorsuch was happier than a kid. And, in a candy store when he got to do that. Like he really is, he is every bit of a conservative of Scalia. And I would say he is a little bit more so because Scalia, I think is going to be, was, was, uh, significantly more of a, um, a, uh, literalist for the, for the constitution. And I think Gorsuch is going to be more interpretive towards that, um, that, uh, conservative bend. And there's no, there's no reason to suggest that this next guy isn't going to be someone who's going to kind of bounce around in the middle. Uh, one of the last links that we have in here is a link from Vox that I uh, that I found, and essentially they uh, talked to a bunch of political scientists and they analyzed a lot of the leanings as to where a lot of these judges have voted for the Supreme Court, where they've been, and how the median has changed and where it's gone over the years. And um, and basically, the the court will be if Kavanaugh is. Uh, um, nominated and confirmed he it will be more conservative than it has been and some people estimate in 90 years it'll be the most conservative supreme court we've had and this is all because people did not go out and vote in 2014 and they they the republicans were able to completely and totally attack all of the um all of the uh the houses and uh the senate i mean this is just this is this is what we farm. These are these are the seeds that we're sowing. Eh, I mean, I'm, I, it's sad, but I mean, there's there's no way to fix it now. And if they if they have to do the the 50, 50, uh, 50 tie and have Vice President Pence break the tie to confirm this guy, they, they won't even hesitate. They will do it for this guy. Exactly, and and that's the sad thing here because, you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, your article shows the progress, you know, and shows where how how far right how far right we've moved. And yeah. you know, NPR has this, you know, the the most disturbing thing about this guy, you know, that relates to how we continue to move far right because a lot of the GOP is consider, considered authoritarian, right? You know, there's a th- authoritarian jaunt to this. And we saw this with Bush. Um we saw it continue with Cheney if uh he had been elected and you know, you know, he he wanted all these other things. And now we're looking at Trump and here instead of Trump being the super far right guy, he's like, oh, I'm going to be semi far right. But hey, let me elect somebody who supported broad leeway for presidents under investigation. What's the yeah. irony in that? I'm sorry, but like we can he's, talk about everything yeah. else. But like that trumps everything and, and, and not in the fact that Trump's a good thing, but in the fact that, you know, before Trump was ever born in card games, we said, I'm going to trump this. So, yeah. you know, I, I get sick of having to defend that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, <laughs> big, the big thing, that, the, the thing that you just mentioned is um, that this judge has been uh, quoted in saying that he does not think that presidents should be uh, 
should ever be charged or indicted while in office, that they should be completely and utterly immune to any kind of wrongdoing and, and criminal proceedings while in office. And so well, essentially, Trump, he, yeah, well, he's he's picking, he's picking, Trump is, is, if you think about it, like if you look at what he said, Trump is picking the guy who will, if this, if, Let's say there's an indictment and something comes through from Mueller that goes for some reason all the way through all the courts and ends in the Supreme Court. There are two Trump picks now that Gorsuch is not going to go against, but not we're not 100 percent certain he's probably not going to go against. I mean, that's a pretty safe bet. Um, We know that Clarence Thomas and Alito are definitely not going to go against uh, against Trump. And so we have Gorsuch. Yeah. And then we also have this new guy and he has basically said that there's no that the president should be immune. And so Trump is hedging his I mean, he he is picking a, a guy who would eventually potentially judge him. And the guy has said that he won't judge him. He's picking the safest thing he could. I mean, this is if you gave if you gave Nixon the power to fire everyone and then not get in trouble for it. Because yes. he got in trouble for firing everyone, and then he got in trouble for it. What we're giving Trump the right to do is basically to break all of these laws and possibly, if it ends up being true, take all kinds of help from the Russians. And then when the Supreme Court gets a chance to really stick it to him, they'll be like, no, he put us here. He's good. We're all good. We'll just live with love, you know, the uh, United, United States of, uh, of, uh, of America slash you know, no longer a democratic republic. That that's basically what he's trying to do here. And so, you know, these are all fears and slippery slopes and things that hopefully the checks and balances will be able to override. Hopefully the founding fathers were able to predict something as obscene and obnoxious as a Donald Trump presidency. But I can't guarantee it anymore. I, I'm I'm along for the ride and I'm trying to do the best I can. But I mean, it's not it's not outside of my future leaving this country if it gets bad enough. Yeah, I don't know. Like you said before. Get your passports, people. Figure out how the <laughs> fuck you're going to do that, because I think we're at that point where we have to have a backup plan to get the fuck out of this country. And I don't know, it's, it's weird because Kavanaugh has, you know, tried to make himself like an umpire, like at a baseball game, right? A sports ball game, you know, for well, those that's what there's a, there's That's what lawyer, or, um, judges are supposed to be. They're supposed to be an impartial judge. So like they're like an umpire. He shouldn't give a crap about either team. He should just be doing what's supposed to be. He loves to say he's doing that. I don't believe he will. I, I, and I don't either. And, and if you look at his past decisions, his past discussions, his past viewpoints, you're not going to see that impartial of a person. And I get it's hard to find those people. It truly is. It's not something that you're just going to be able to walk out and say, yep, you're that person. I, I couldn't I, be that person. I'm, I know I'm how, not impartial. I, I know how they used to find those people is when they did not ha- then they had to get 60 people in Senate to confirm a judge going into the Supreme Court. And so it had to be bipartisan. There had to be Democrats and Republicans who voted for these people. Like yeah. that's what it came down to. They had a leader in the Senate, Republican or Democrat, who said, listen, we have to make this work. They didn't burn down everything. So there had to be a simple majority. And, you know, essentially what we turn to now is at a point where whoever has a simple majority, whichever party has it has the ability to because i mean that is it's it's, it's, you know one vote a simple majority whichever party has it can just they can throw a supreme court judge in all they have to have is 51 votes and whichever party has the majority wins almost every time i mean every once in a while you'll have someone like john mccain throw a wrench into it but in in most cases it really is a simple majority now and so like this this has ruined any kind of bipartisan judge selection that's how it used to be you used to have to find somebody who was kind of sort of in the middle who represented all of the people in the country because it had to have some Democrats and some Republicans who supported him. Now it's get, that's gone. That is gone. Yeah. And nobody knows where it's going to go in the future. I do know that as we wrap Seller Skeptics up tonight on a little bit more of a serious note than we did last week, we can, in all fairness, feel confident that you can still make a difference. You can still make a difference. Vote. Vote, Figure out how you're going to vote. Figure it out because without... We're going to try to help. Without being able to vote, without being able to go out and make a difference, we're going to end up in a uh, autocracy or an authoritarian dictatorship. And... (laughs) 
you know what? Well, you, Han and I will probably be one of the first people that get rounded up and put in camps. I, I, I am den- I am seriously afraid of the day when um, arm bans for non-believers, and they'll check your Facebook history if I don't get banned permanently from a Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be back next week with another amazing episode. Oh, it's good. It's a good time to not live the United States. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We'll be back next week. If you haven't fled the country and you can still tune in, check us out on iTunes, Spreaker, or any of your local podcast catchers. Thank you all. Have a good night, and we'll be back next week with another amazing episode. Have a good night, everyone. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. CellarDoorSkeptics.com <laughs>